as artists, um, why should we only draw and paint what we see? Isn't it really cool to draw and paint what we imagine as well as what we see? So when I'm faced with a limitation, like getting a tree frog, I see somebody here, so Daniel says, can we draw the Titanica tree frog, uh, Titanica water frog? I can look that up. Um, so we can, we can look up things online, but the, the thing I'd emphasize is don't try to draw and perfectly capture like a photograph online. Like if you go on YouTube, you'll see, let me see how to spell this water frog. Um, and so back to my initial point, you go on YouTube, you go on different channels and you can see like how to draw Brad Pitt and you see a portrait of like a movie star and they capture like every little piece of information and it's a pretty compelling, looks like a really amazing black white photo. But I'm gonna be a little bit critical for a moment. That's not necessarily drawing. Drawing is not necessarily just capturing little gradients of value everywhere. But drawing is understanding how the thing is built. And that's what you guys and I, that's what we've been working with. How do you build the, the subject that you're looking for? How do you build a tree frog? So that's what we're going to jump into. I, uh, let me know, let me see if we're gonna pull this up like that. And I'm gonna jump over to this screen. So this, we're gonna start with this guy. Uh, I would actually love, if possible, to get several frogs on the screen. So to begin with, I'm just gonna pull him up. We're gonna zoom in on him. And I see a suggestion for the poison dart frog. I think I'm gonna go with this guy. And then if we get to the next frog, um, we'll try to get to the poison dart frog. Oh, let me do this really quick. I always like to give the person who uh, photographed this credit. So. The author is Liquid Ghoul, edited by Muhammad. Um, so we are looking at a tree frog on Wikimedia, uh, uploaded by those guys. So with that, we'll jump right in. All right, so he's up in the corner. The first thing I'm going to do as I look at the tree frog is I'm going to really try to think in the big, biggest, broadest terms. You know me, like if you've taken these courses, you know I emphasize like one thing like over and over and over again. We want to think big and broad to start with. And so we're going to pick out like the biggest shapes. So that's like pretty much right there, more or less the shape of this guy's head. And then we're going to, you know what? We could already start with his eyes. He's got such big beady eyes. Um, these things are just so awesome that we could pop those in on either side like so. All right, cool. So now I would say we could jump into the body. And so for the body, we're going to just kind of put like a, I'm almost thinking of this as being, it's almost like a cube, just like bent over. So it's like, think of almost like a floppy shaped cube. And it's almost like bent over. So it's like curled over and inserting on the sides will be the shapes of the arms. So I got the one arm right here and that pops off. He's got an elbow, just like he's got a shoulder. He's got an elbow, just like you. And so that's going to be like a pipe. And then we got the other arm right here. And again, we're thinking of these things as just being like basic pipes. Anytime you look at a drawing, again, don't sit down and try to draw like all the tiny scales of the frog at first. Rather try to see like the whole pipe of the whole arm, the whole body, the whole entire head. And let's try to build this thing as if we're like almost working with clay or something of that sort. So, okay, big shape here, big shape here. Got the pipe of the arm. Now let's get the fingers. So the fingers are hilarious. Like, I don't know about you guys, but when I look at things like tree frogs, to me, they look like they're just out of somebody's like imagination, like computer video games or something like that. They don't even look real. Um, and I look at these things and I think the wonderful thing, when, when you start from the place of that, you know, as we, as I believe, like that God made the heavens and the earth, you know, it says in Genesis, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. When you start at that place and you say, okay, I'm gonna take that as the given in this equation, then you can see authorship in everything. So you can actually see part of God's personality in something as silly as a tree frog. And you look at it and you, you can almost see that God has a sense of humor because you have these big, goofy, gluey kind of like fingertips. And just 
everything like turns in a round way. It's just so fun. All right, so I got those kind of mapped out. Um, now, I'm not gonna do it <laughs> too much in my own studio, but if you look at me and I have like my, my knee like this and I have my shoulder right here, um, I can't get up any higher because I'll fall over and then you guys will be laughing your head off and you won't be able to concentrate on the drawing. But you can see his arms, his arms are out like this, right? And you can see his knee is up really high. The crazy thing about a frog is that it has a strikingly similar anatomy to everyone here on the phone call in that they have, you know, the, there's the vertebrae, there's a rib cage, there's, there's shoulders, there's upper arms and lower arms, they have knees. Um, but the proportion of everything is in, obviously, taking away the fact that he's so tiny, the proportion of everything is built for a different purpose. So take a look at this tree frog for a moment and notice how the tree frog is, the tree frog has actually got these enormous back legs. So we could see it better at another angle, but you could say like, why does a tree frog, or why does any frog have these enormous back legs? And the answer is, if somebody comes along and they want to eat it or they want to smush it, whatever they want to do, that guy has to be able to all of a sudden out of nowhere just explode with a ton of power. So because he needs all that power, he needs to have these massive back legs. Think of it almost as being like a jet engine to get him out of trouble quick. And so God designed him that way so these big powerful back legs can explode with force. So as we look at our drawing, we can put these knees back here and from another angle, again, it's gonna look different. Tree frogs probably have less explosive power than, I don't know, like maybe like another type of frog that's sitting on a log all day. But just the same, we, can, we feel all that potential energy in that back leg right there. So we have one, two, three fingers on that leg. And then we have the leg over here. And this knee right here kind of like sticks out a little bit more. And then I don't really like the way um, his, his one leg, like it's like all kind of like folded up. I don't know if you see that right there. Um, I don't think the photo like is really like so great at that angle. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna change it up and design it so that it looks a little bit better from our angle. So right here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, maybe I'm gonna stick one sticker toe thing out. The other one's gonna come down like this. There's another sticker toe. And then the last one is, I don't know, it's gonna go like kind of like that. So it kind of like, it's not a true repetition of this, but it like echoes this. Maybe if I wanna give it a little bit more interest, I'll bend this guy. In drawing and painting, you never wanna have like a perfect clone of something side by side. You always wanna change it up a little bit and have some variety. So. Okay, so I'm pretty happy with that. Um, so what I'm going to do now is everything here is a geometric essence, right? I'm gonna pretend that my light source is over here and to the left and the light is shining down on the frog like so. So if this right here is uh, uh, just considered to be an oval, then what we can do is we can start carving out the external contour. And as we carve it out, we're gonna think that, okay, there's gonna be a shadow over here. You can even make the line on the far side of the face a little bit darker and a little bit heavier. And so I'm going a little bit darker down here. And this is a trick that I learned from studying Renaissance painting. And if you ever wanna further your drawing skills and read some, it's kind of pretty heavy material, but there's a book that I would suggest it's called drawing lessons from the great masters. Have your parents look through the book, make sure that they approve of it. There's a lot of old artwork in it. And um, drawing lessons from the great masters, it just talks about all the Renaissance tradition drawing and painting techniques. And when I was a young man, I read it and it was one of the most powerful books. And they taught, uh, Robert Beverly Hale in this book teaches that if light comes from above and to the left, he said, dig in a little bit darker and heavier away from the light source. So you see how I'm digging in a little bit darker and heavier on the outside of the eye right here? And then I'm leaving that, I might even like tap it out a little bit with an eraser 
to let it go a little bit fainter. So that gives a sense of gravity and weight to the eye right there. So I'm seeing that somebody, okay, Daniel and Dan has uh, written Titty Kaka for the, for the frog. I have the craziest thing to tell you. I have been to Lago Titicaca in Bolivia. It's the highest, biggest freshwater lake in the world. It's like miles up in the sky. And I went there with my wife uh, 20 years ago and it's surrounded by salt plains and desert and mountains and stuff like that. I actually went to Titicaca. Maybe I saw a frog there and I didn't even know. I was looking at a Titicaca frog in Bolivia in the middle of the desert, so kind of fun. All right, back to our lesson. So. All right, so we weigh in heavier right here. So let's now house this eye. Let's put it in kind of like, like almost like a, a surrounding. So this is his eye socket right here. And it kind of comes around like so. And then he's got like a bit of a flat top between his eyes. And the flat top comes over like so. And it just turns right here. And then we have another, think of it as being almost like your eye socket. Always, whenever, whenever God created something, if it was very, very important, it was very uh, essential to the, to the creature, he always designed it that he housed it in protection. So your eyeball is protected by this amazing socket right here. So if somebody comes and they say, hey, Kevin, I don't like your drawing of a frog, and they punch me in the face like that, um, the the blow on my face is going to be absorbed by my eye socket right here. Nobody's going to punch me because I drew a frog poorly, but it was just a joke. Um, but if I get hit, feel around your eyeball. Go ahead and feel that. And feel how this absorbs the blow so that what's really sensitive and precious inside of it is protected. It's a marvel. It's absolutely amazing. So this right here is the housing in which the eye sits. And so we kind of have this and it wraps around. And then the frog, um, I think if you were teaching class with frogs in it, it'd be hard to know if they were paying attention because one eye would be looking at you and the other eye would be looking you know, across the other side of the room. You'd never really know if you had the frog's full attention. So these are profound insights by Kevin McAvoy. All right, so have that mapped out. You can, kind of start to see this guy's getting a bit of a personality and we're just going to move on to the mouth. The mouth cuts across the bottom of the face and it goes pretty straight. It's actually not curved. It goes pretty straight right across, makes a turn and comes back up again. So I kind of like how this is all curvilinear, um, it's just all round lines. And then that mouth is surprisingly straight. I wouldn't have done that if I was inventing a frog out of my own imagination. Which brings up a really cool theme that I return to all the time. Draw from nature because nature will endlessly surprise you. When you work from references of the world around you, um, you can just, you're always fascinated by the things that nature will do that you didn't expect. So, okay, so here's the bottom of the mouth right here. And it kind of turns tight. Um, all right, so this guy, I don't know what's going on with him. I think that we probably have like a few frog experts on this phone call uh, where I'm amazed by how my son Quinlan knows much more about birds than I've ever known in my life. So chances are we have a couple of you guys that just know a lot about frogs. Um, I don't know if this guy's sleeping, but man, it looks like he's taking a nap. So let's jump over to the big picture of him. Just look at how those eyes are just tiny little slits. So again, may not be sleeping, but he looks like it to me. So, all right, I'm kind of done with the face right here. I've leaned in heavy on the external contour of the sphere of the eye away from the light source, gone in dark and heavy right here. It's even useful sometimes to keep a pencil nearby that is really dull. And uh, if you check out this pencil right here, check out how dull that pencil is. So maybe I'll hold it up to the other camera so you can see. That's a pretty dull pencil. Um, it's not like razor sharp or anything like that. That pencil is like 
really pretty dull. Now I'm going to show you another type of pencil that I work with that's pretty sharp. So check out dull and sharp next to each other. So sometimes people think you want every pencil to be really sharp like this guy, but in actuality, having a dull pencil that's dark is great because look at this. You can actually dig in away from the light source and look at that. You can get really, really dark and rich and crit. Uh, it's, it's really dark and rich. And I made a mistake there. And I'm going to dig in really dark on the far side of the mouth right here. All right, cool. So now it's feeling like it's taking form. Uh, the guy definitely feels like he's getting a little bit of a personality. Let's jump over. Um, I'm going back to like kind of a pencil in the middle of the road. This is a, a B pencil. You can go with a 2B pencil. Um, and then I'm just going to map out that far arm right here. He turns right here. This is kind of like his armpit right here. So when you talk to your friends later today, you can tell them that you drew frog armpits in class and you'll be the coolest person in your whole circle. And I can see a few of you, Hana, I can see you laughing at my jokes and I just feel re really reinforced right now. So I appreciate that. <laughs> All right, so now I'm going down to the, the bottom. This kind of ended, look, take a look for a moment at how this is landing on the same level. So this is a pretty important uh, point actually. Try to avoid sameness in your drawings and in your paintings. Um, when you go into Manhattan, when you go into Chicago, when you go to like some big city, one of the things that gets to me is a lot of building these days can be very sane perfect symmetry, everything's on a level. Um, but to break it up and have like variation, to me, that's the sign of like interest. I just like that in my work. So this right here is too much the same where those toes fall. So check this out. I'm gonna intentionally skew it and I'm gonna bring that one finger, finger, toe, whatever you wanna call this thing, phalange, I'm gonna bring it down a little bit further and then I'm gonna bring this one up a little bit higher. And by doing that, that lends visual interest to the drawing. All right, so now I'm gonna jump over to that knee on the far side. I'm switching back to the lighter pencil. I'm going lighter where the light is coming from on the external contour. And in any of these uh, classes, if I'm ever using like terminology that's confusing like external contour, um, I explain all these things on the website and so as you get further into the courses, you'll see like, I thoroughly go into, okay, what is the external contour? Okay, so now I'm gonna dig in right here at that little suction cup finger. And rounding the corner for this toe right here, trying to keep the lyricism of this frog. So that brings up another cool topic so lyricism is this whole idea that everything in the world around us is imbued with a calligraphy. So um, by calligraphy, do you guys know calligraphy? Like let's say like there's this like, like a lot of time Hallmark cards, like you get them and it says to a grandmother who's very special and the calligraphy is all swooshy like that, right? Or think for a moment about German calligraphy or old English calligraphy and it's very linear and it's very like, structured in a vertical way. So if, how many of you guys by raising your hand know calligraphy? Different types of like alphabets. So when you talk about calligraphy, what you mean is that the rhythmic line of that alphabet is different. So the French calligraphy, again, it really flows. Old English calligraphy is very vertical. Irish calligraphy is very rounded. Um, so every different part of the world has different calligraphies. Now, you could take that idea of calligraphy and you can actually apply it to nature. So you can say that the calligraphy of, let's say, a tree frog is very round and bubbly, right? But then you say the calligraphy of, let's pick something else out that's totally different. The calligraphy of a um, jagged rock in Arizona that's been carved by the howling winds. Um, the calligraphy of 
who can think of something in nature that's like really sharp, like that like is like around us? I'm trying to think of like an animal that has like all sharp lines in it. Maybe like a snowflake when you zoom it up close, it's at all geometric angles. Um, so those are different calligraphies and you could say like, what on earth does this have to do with tree frogs? Which is a valid question. A shark, a shark has really sharp, like those fins on the top of those dorsal fins. I always forget the names of the fins really really sharp lines like the angles are really severe a tiger crazy like sharp teeth right these are great uh great um examples those are forms of calligraphy that you all know so if you look at a tiger and he has these crazy teeth coming down you're scared because you say the calligraphy of those teeth can do a lot of damage to my flesh <laughs> um whereas when you look at if you looked at a horse and a horse is looking at you with his face and he's like, and his teeth are up and they, all of his teeth are squares, you're like, oh, I'm not really that afraid. Because you know calligraphy, your eye picks up on calligraphy. Tree frogs have calligraphy and we, with everything that we do, we want to be sensitive to the calligraphy of the thing that we're working on so that we can kind of like draw out like the virtues of the thing that we're, we're working on. In addition to animals having calligraphy, um, people have calligraphy. So probably the, the creative individuals that know this the best nowadays um, would be something like an animator. So if you look at like in the world of animation, how many of you guys have ever seen the program Aladdin? So in the program Aladdin, uh, the lines of all the, of all the characters, Jafar, has this long, sharp, angular, like everything is like really severe. It's really scary looking because his calligraphy is very threatening. And then if you look at the genie in Aladdin, everything on him is round and everything is like very welcoming. And Disney animators, Pixar animators, um, I'm going back to the golden era of Disney, not a huge fan now, uh, but the golden era of Pix of Disney and the great works that have come out of Pixar they know a lot about the calligraphies of like, let's say tree frogs, and they actually imbue their characters with these traits. And I just find stuff like that to be so cool. So I'm really trying to get his bubbly calligraphy. And I was hoping to get to two tree frogs. I think we're going to hold off on the other tree frog. Um, and then we will do it in an upcoming class. Um, I think it's fun to do another class on tree frogs and we'll just do it in a really different position. That would be really fun. Okay, so now I got the leg coming down here and it kind of like turns. I got the leg right here, it turns. All right, so now I'm going to start cleaning this up. I'm going to I call these exploratory lines. So these are the lines that I searched with in the beginning. And I just clean them up a little bit, like so. Uh, if you want a really highly rendered drawing, you can go to town and really clean it up. But I'm just gonna leave it like that. That's, that's good enough for me at this point. Now, with light coming from here, let's reduce this whole entire thing to a geometric essence. This is one big oval. Oh, I forgot one thing. This guy has a nose. And so we got to put in these little tiny nostrils right here. And they go just like that. All right, cool. So now let's reduce this whole thing to one geometric essence. And we're just going to go ahead in and we're going to shade the far side of the face. So you'll remember from all the other classes that we've done together, it almost seems like um, as I suggest this one product, it might seem like almost I'm like, uh, I own stock in the company. Uh, but I, I really like to use graphite powder and graphite powder is just something that, um, it allows me to take a shortcut almost, so to speak. So I'm going to zoom over to the camera with the graphite powder. And Daniel was saying, we've drawn a tree frog before. Yes, indeed we have. Um, and then. I thought it'd be really fun to put three tree frogs on one branch. So, okay, over to the, over to the uh, drawing section right here. This is my graphite powder. See that? 
And so that graphite powder, it comes in a bag. You can get it, um, you can just buy it at any art supply, like online. And you can put your finger in it, and then I have the graphite powder sitting right here. And so what I do then, is I go back to my drawing, and I can put the graphite powder on the far side, and I can like fast forward my whole drawing to get like immediate shade. So personally, like I love stuff like that, where it's like you can get an effect really quick. So maybe I went a little bit too, too dark too far. If you're using graphite powder, um, you can just erase away, just like that. But as most of you probably don't have graphite powder, I don't want you to feel like you've been left out. Just go back to your pencil. If you don't have graphite powder, go back to your pencil and you can get a really broad effect really quick by just going like that with your pencil. So again, don't feel left out, but just go ahead and, and shade in the area big and broad like that. And you can do the same thing as I did with the graphite powder. Check this out, ready? You can smudge with your finger and you can cover a lot of ground really quick, just like so. I'm gonna go back to my graphite powder uh, for the simple reason that this is a, you know, it's a shorter live stream and it's 45 minutes. Um, and I wanna have like a good effect for you guys so that you can see the result quick. The next thing that I oftentimes use that if you guys don't have, you can make a, a blending stump and the blending stump right here, you can dip it in the graphite powder or you can use the blending stump by just putting in the, the graphite with your pencil and going like that. So you can either dip it or you can draw it. This blending stump, you can just twirl paper to make your own one. And then you can fast forward on the far side of every geometric essence. So this is a sphere. And if you have questions about how to draw a sphere, again, head over to the website and you'll have thorough lessons in drawing spheres. And then I'm gonna go like this on the far side, this right here, this arm, we could consider that arm as being like, let's say a pipe. And so this is like a cylinder right here. And so that cylinder runs like this. And we know that when light hits a cylinder, kind of like from the side and above that it's gonna throw a shadow on the far side. So again, I'm gonna take this and I'm just gonna put a shadow on the far side of that arm. I'm gonna go down to the leg right here to the uh, fingertips, I should say. Um, so all of this could seem like, oh, this is really simple stuff. But what's really neat is that you could then take this drawing and using these concepts, you could push just about anything in nature really far. And if I had something that I wanted to impart to young art students, it's that you as art students of course, it's good to draw what's in front of you and to understand how to copy something in front of you, but it's even more important that you learned how to build it. That you learn how these geometric essences work and then you light it as you see fit. And I'll give you an example of that in just a moment. So as an artist, what if you decided, okay, my picture is of a tree frog and it's really cool and I like this tree frog, but I want the lighting effect to be really scary. So you want to take the light and you want to put it underneath the tree frog. And you want to have it like underlit. So you guys know, like, have you ever like been in the tent at night and you get your flashlight out and you click it on your face and you go, oh, and, like your face looks like all scary. When you light your face from underneath, you look scary, right? So if you want your tree frog to look scary for some funny reason, um, you could make up your own lighting. You could say, oh, I remember that his head is just a big egg. If the light's hitting the bottom of the egg, the top of the egg is gonna be dark. So it sounds like a limiting concept in a way, maybe because you could say like, well, I, I think that, you know, I wanna, I wanna learn how to push paintings really far. I wanna learn how to draw realistically. Um, this is a limited concept. The artists who I'm friends with, who are the very best artists in the whole world, they know this concept better than anyone and they work on it a lot to really master it. So this is not uh, an elementary concept that you can just like, you know, like kind of like dispense with, but it's something that you can really explore for the rest of your life. All right, so now I have 
each of these eyeballs, I'm going to put them into shadow like that. Um, one of the things you'll remember as we all always uh, work together is we can use a little bit of a background. Um, we could take the background and we could pop off the foreground by darkening the background behind the light side. So if that sounds complicated, it simply means this. We can take a sphere right here and if we light it from here, if we put shade on the far side of that sphere, we can make that sphere pop off even more by shading the background against the light side. And by shading that background against the light side, the dark side appears to be dark. The light side now has just gotten lighter and it causes the light to lift off that egg right there. So likewise, we can put shade right behind the frog's head right here. And we could pop off the frog's head right off the page. Now, um, I'm gonna tell you kind of a cool story of something that happened this week and somebody came to me and it is it's a person who visited my studio and so um, I'm not trying to brag so if it sounds like I'm showing off forgive me but the guy who came to my studio he's a very famous uh, state supreme court judge and he's really high up and when he came to my studio he said Kevin he's like I really want you to paint a portrait of my wife. And I'm gonna fast forward the whole story. And he said, the reason why I want to, you to paint a portrait of my wife is because you have this way of making like people like come like alive, like right off the canvas. And you also have an ability to like capture like their human spirit. And I was like, well, those are two things I really love doing in art. And he's like, well, it shows. And so um, I got the biggest commission of my whole life yesterday. And so they already paid for half of it. Um, and it was owing to these very qualities that I'm teaching about now. So I wouldn't talk about them if I didn't think that they were super, super important for you guys as artists. All right, so as I go darker over here, then what I can do is I can now, I can now sharpen, I can clean up the light right up against that dark and maybe if you have a kneaded eraser, you can clean up your eraser by, it's called snapping your eraser. So I go like that and I clean up my eraser. So now it's kind of clean right there. And then you can clean up your drawing and really pop off those lights. And I'm just carving out those lights right up against that dark right there. Okay, so now, I'm going to grab this really sharp pencil. So maybe this is a little bit too light. Uh, that was a 5H pencil. Let me see if I can find like, yeah, this is an H pencil. This is perfect. I use the pencil extenders because it saves me. I don't have to throw out a pencil when it gets super short. And now I'm going to sharpen really crisp, make like, not necessarily so dark, but I'm going to make crisp lines up against the dark right here. And then I'm going to shade right up against it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna zoom in on this even more so you can see what I'm doing. So check out how I go really crisp with the line and then I go really, really sharp. And by doing that, it really makes the frog's eyes appear to like pop off. So I love this stage of the drawing because um, as you start to do this, the thing really starts to come alive. When I oil paint, I do this same thing, but just in paints, where I get it really, really crisp and sharp up against the lights. And then I pop the light off with that dark background. And if it gets a little bit too scratchy, one of the things you can do is you can blend in like this. You can kind of soften the background because you don't want the background to be too scratchy, or maybe you do, it's up to you. So I'll go like that. But the, now you can see how this is really starting to lift off. And if you want, you can get even a darker pencil. So this is a B pencil right here. I'll show you how I switch over and let me move this out of the way. And yep, that's a little bit better. And I will sharpen on sandpaper. This is just basic sandpaper from the hardware store. And I sharpen this up, I get this nice and sharp over here. Back to my drawing. 
I have a nice and sharp dark pencil. So again, that's, that's a B pencil right there. And I'll take that and now I'll go even darker in the background, right beside the light on the frog's head. And so a lot of what I'm teaching you guys today is how to accent certain passages of a drawing. And I use this constantly, constantly in my paintings. I won't accent everywhere. I won't make it equally dark everywhere, but I'll just do it in portions of my drawing because our eyes are drawn to areas of real violent contrast. And our eyes are also drawn to areas of real uh, sharpness. Okay, so now I have it really sharp and dark over here. Let's zoom out for a moment. And do you see how the frog's face like pops off on this side right here? Um, what we can do on, on the eyes now is we can go really dark. We want to capture like that, the slits of the eyes right here. And it's really dark over here. Now there's this whole other world of drawing that, of uh, detail that you can do in this drawing where if you zoom in on the picture, take a look at all of those scales. Um, so a lot of times I started out this lesson today and said, when you're trying to draw something, don't go like right for the detail. Just try to cap capture, like make the thing look like the thing, but try to understand it and how it's built. And so if you look at the, uh, the image right here, what you'll see is you'll see all these amazing scales, like all over his nose. I mean, that's really cool. So as you work, you can now go into your drawing and you can put the scale pattern very delicately into what you've already mapped out. And so I like to talk about Pixar and things of that sort, because I think it's a, I think computer animation uh, is pretty neat and it's, it's just an exciting moment in the visual arts. What they'll do in Pixar studios is they actually build models inside of a computer, almost like clay. They build the models and then they put texture on top of those models. But first they have to build the models underneath. And that's, I was talking to a friend of mine who's right at the top of Pixar Studios. And he said um, that this is exactly how they work. He's like, yep, that's exactly, we do the same exact thing. So if you're interested in a career in like Pixar or something like that, what I always suggest to people is become really, really good at classical drawing. That's what Pixar animators, uh, that's what those studios and places like that, that's what they're really looking for. So, okay, so I've got most of this mapped out and this is around the time where I like to um, pan over and take a look at your drawing. So I'm just gonna carve away this guy's lower lip and then I'll have a sense of his, his lip, like kind of like, I don't know, for me, it, it kind of looks like a person whose lip is like sticking out. That gives it a little bit more character right there. And that is my frog. Uh, but now it's that time where we look at your drawing. So if you guys want to write your name.